Wow. I've been in lots of Christian college chapels, and I don't think I've ever seen one as lively and enthusiastic as this one here. So thank you all. I was with a group of people last night, 30 older people, and we were all waxing somewhat pessimistic about the future of America. But I feel much better seeing all of you this morning. <laughs> so, in fact, I asked one person last night, well, should I wear a tie to chapel today? And I was told, it's not that kind of chapel. And so, so the kingdom of God does not require wearing a tie. And I appreciate you all. And so, okay, so you're here at Ozark because you want to serve. We just heard that this morning. I suspect you hear that just about every day. And in relation to the poor, you want to be generous. That's what the Bible certainly teaches. The question is how to be generous with discernment, how to actually help rather than sometimes hurt with our good wishes. I've done a lot of coverage of baseball games in my time as a journalist, and I remember one pitching coach from the Pittsburgh Pirates who said his job as a pitching coach was to put old heads on young bodies. And that is some ways what the Bible does. For all your young bodies, you can have the wisdom of, of the past and the present and the future because it's God's wisdom. So I'm going to take you through a few biblical passages and compare them, in a sense, with what you may have heard about how to be generous and what the Bible actually talks about, how to be generous with discernment. And it really starts, in a way, with Genesis 2, right there in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So this is before Genesis 3. This is before the fall. This is good stuff. It is good to work. Physical work, Adam is a gardener, and then intellectual work. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So there's physical work as a gardener, there's intellectual work, having to really see what an animal is like and find an appropriate name for it. This is before the fall. So work is not a bad thing. You know, we've probably heard, um, you know, happy hour is after work. The happiest days are after work. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. Work is very important. You've probably also heard, um, thank God it's Friday, TGIF. You know, the best time of the week, the weekend is ahead. Well, the Bible five times gives us what's called the Sabbath commandment, but it's actually six-sevenths the work commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Now, after the fall, work is harder at times. There are thorns and thistles, but it's still good. And it's very much a part of how God created us and how God makes us and keeps us human to be able to work. And so if you take away work from a person, if you just tell a person, well, there's really no work you can do. Um, you know, we'll just, we'll just feed you and house you and clothe you and give you medicine, but just sit around. You don't have to work. That's not a favor to a person. That's a curse to a person because God made us to work. You've heard it said that uh, we should give to the, to the needy automatically and not ask any questions. Let me read you from John chapter 5. This is at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, there lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? That's a crucial question. And the man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water stirred up while I'm going another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, he took up his bed and walked. Now, Jesus, of course, had discernment that none of us has. But still, here Jesus asks a question. Do you want to be healed? That's a crucial question to ask every person who has sunk into poverty or misery. You can't want it more for a person than the person wants it himself. You can't force a person to be healed. You have to want to be healed, and that's one of the things the Bible teaches us. And there are some people who are, let's say, addicted to drugs or alcohol and have sunk into misery, and you think, what a miserable situation, but in a way, they're used to it. They don't want to be healed at that point, which doesn't mean that a week later or a month later they, they might be the same, but you have to ask the question, do you want to be healed? It's a crucial question to ask. You've heard it said probably that if you're at the freeway entrance and you see a person with a sign, you should give a dollar or five dollars or whatever. Let me quote you from Acts chapter 3. 
Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. A man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand and raised him up. Immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Now, we don't have that kind of miraculous power, but we have to be asking that same question. We have to be saying, look at us, actually make contact with the person, treat him as a human being, not just, not just a, like a pet who you may put some food in his bowl, but treat him as a human being and give him the most important thing. Give Jesus Christ of Nazareth and be able to, in that way, say, we have the power to rise up and walk. You've, you've heard it said that we should not require any work without offering charity. We should do it pretty much automatically. Well, I think as we've already seen from, those, uh, from chapter 2 of Genesis uh, and then the Sabbath, the work commandment in Exodus chapter 20, that work is important, work is valuable. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, really lays this on. Now we can, this is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know whom you ought to imitate, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor do we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you and ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? That sounds miserable. But here Paul goes on to say, we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. So if a person isn't working, you've probably heard this old saying about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the if in, in time that's not working, just sitting around, this is where the devil plays his mischief. You know, this is essentially what Paul is saying. We heard that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. And Paul really accentuates this in 1 Timothy here that uh, uh, who are the people closest to God's heart in so many ways? Widows and orphans. So you think, wow, if anyone is deserving of automatic help, it's a widow. But here's what Paul says to Timothy. Let a widow be enrolled, that is in the church, for help if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, has, known, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their, for, their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, seeing what they should not. So again, you see this seems very harsh. So what are we to make of this? This is what God says. This is what God's inspired writer said. How do we put this to use? Now, I want to mention, I've, I've given you a whole lot of verses here that, that emphasize work, emphasize discernment in giving, emphasize asking questions. But I don't want to dodge one verse that might seem to counter everything I've just said. And this is from Matthew 5.42, from the Sermon on the Mount, give to the one who begs to you. So I suspect you've heard it said. That means give to the, give to the homeless person with a sign by the freeway. Well, one of the things you need to do and learn as you, and I'm, I suspect you've learned that already in your Bible studies, let me just emphasize it, is to be discerning and let Scripture interpret Scripture. So if you see one verse, you want to look at it in terms of a lot of other verses, and in fact, the whole counsel of God. So here are two chapters later in Matthew. There's the famous question uh, that Jesus is asking, which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? So that helps in interpreting gift to everyone who asks you, what's a gift? Giving implies giving a gift. What is a gift? Uh, giving an alcoholic or an addict uh, just some money at that point. And again, this is not everyone who's signing, but it's lots of people. I mean, there are studies said that about 90% of the people who are out panhandling are gonna use the money for, for alcohol or drugs. Uh, what's a gift? Which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? 
A stone is not a gift. It's giving something, but it's not a gift. Giving an alcoholic or addict money that's going to be used for drugs, most likely is like weighing him down with stones and throwing him into the ocean. It's not kindness, it's not charity, it's not mercy. It's cruelty, it might make you, make, might make you feel good, it's going to hurt the person. So these are the things, and again, this is not everyone, this is someone. Uh, a great situation there, if someone does ask you uh, for money for food, is say, yeah, come, come with me to McDonald's, and let's have something together. Ask questions, talk with the person, treat them as a human being, not just as a person to a dog to put food in his bowl. And then the most quoted passage, probably, of all the passages that you may hear in relation to, to poverty. Uh, this is from Matthew 25. It's a very famous passage, and rightly so. Jesus is saying, when I was hungry and you gave me food, uh, when I was thirsty, you gave me drink, I was a stranger and you welcomed me, I was naked and you clothed me, I was sick and you visited me, I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous, and that's meant a little sarcastically, will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as I did it to the one, as I did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And you'll often hear this referred to as just the least of these. It's a powerful passage. But let's think about that for a moment. Because again, the enthusiasm is great, I don't want you to lose it, but I, I want you to get a have a, an old, that is a, a Bible old knowledge head on a young body. Let's see, if we, if we, as much as we did to a person, it's like doing it to Jesus. What if we give some money, don't ask any questions, and it's something that furthers an addiction or alcoholism? It's like pumping heroin into Jesus' veins. It's like pouring whiskey down his throat. It's not helping, it's hurting. So discernment is just so important here. What's the better way at your age to give? I mean, probably a lot of you don't have much money anyway to give. What you do have is time. I mean, I know you work very hard in your studies, a lot of you are working otherwise, but you have as much time as the richest person in the world. No matter how rich a person is, he can't have more than 24 hours in a day or seven days in a week or 365 days in, in a year. You are equally rich to that rich person in time. So how do you spend your time at your age? Uh, there are kids here uh, in Joplin who are in the fourth grade and they can't read. And that person is going to be condemned very likely to a life of poverty and probably fall into all sorts of miserable situations. If you can spend an hour a week tutoring a child, helping him to read, then you are doing to the least of these, and therefore you're doing it to Jesus. If you, you heard about the Life Choices Pregnancy Center, if you volunteer there, again, you're doing to the least of these, you're doing it for Jesus. And of course, the, uh, the watered missions, the, uh, uh, and you already heard about that watered gardens. I mean, that's a way to be truly, truly generous to give of your time, which is very limited, and you'll never have, no matter how affluent you become, you'll never have more than 24 hours in a day, or 168 hours in a week. So if you even give one of those hours in this person-to-person -person help, tutoring, or counseling a young woman going through a crisis pregnancy center, uh, or volunteering at Water Gardens, I mean, that really, I think, from these Bible passages is the type of charity that God really commands. So I hope you'll be Generous, truly generous, truly generous in your time, generous in your money also, if you do so with discernment, um, and keep the enthusiasm. I mean, you are the future of this country, and we are desperately in need of people who are alive with Christ and willing to lay themselves out, doing to the least of these, and therefore doing it to Christ himself. So thank you for your attention. I pray that God will bless you and bless Ozark. Christian College. Amen.